one nickname just described a person. None could be better than Rick Nifty Middleson, because he was so incredibly nifty with the puck, nifty with the little moves he'd make, and it fit so perfectly. Ricky was a great hockey player. He was a great Boston Bruin. Not only on the ice, but also off the ice. He has as big a heart as any person I've ever met. You could just count on him. Made him one of the great all-around players. If you know the game, if you played the game, if you've seen how he played the game, you just had to smile because he defied description on some of the things he did. He was one of the great players that just played totally on instinct and went out there and did what had to be done. Really did it all. A complete player. He put people uh, on the edge of their seat because he was such a dynamic and exciting player to watch. He was just amazing the way he could shift his body on the ice. Because he was so deceptive, he was so good offensively. Just when the defenders thought they had him, he would lean a little bit one way or make a move the other direction. He is a legend. Um, the skills were unbelievable, but the subtle nature of his brilliance was something that you get so used to him making this place, and you'd almost say, like, oh, that's just Ricky, but no one else could make them. Those are the kind of little things that separated him. He was one of the smartest players that played the game. So many teams would put in their best goaltender, their best defenseman, their top defensive line against Ricky, and they couldn't stop him. Ricky would score one of those spectacular goals or one of his great passes, and for weeks, you'd be walking around town and everyone would go oh wow did you see that rick middleton goal he was unbelievable he could even score goals while you're a man short I've seen him do some incredible things and really scoring so many highlight goals and some big goals and just a lot of fun to watch right Phenomenally unique talent in every single situation. He was a great Boston Bruin. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome tonight's Master of Ceremonies, Andy Brickley. Phenomenal. What a player. What a Bruin. I could watch that highlight reel every night. Thank you, Jim. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It truly is a great pleasure to serve as your host for this historic ceremony tonight, where we celebrate and honor one of the greatest Bruins of all time and raise the 11th number in Boston Bruins history to the Raptors. I'd like to uh, extend a welcome to all the Bruins fans here tonight at TD Garden, as well as all the other Boston Bruins fans that are watching along on Nesson. Tonight is a night of celebration of a player whose compassion, his class, his excellence off the ice created a man of unparalleled talent on the ice. Rick Middleton came to the Bruins in a trade with the New York Rangers in May of 1976. For the next 12 seasons, he entertained Bruins fans with his dynamic, creative, What's he gonna do next? Unique style of play. He was a 50 goal scorer, a 100 point player, but more than that, he played the game the right way. His commitment, his passion, his desire to win, and his desire 
to be the very best every game was always on display. His teammates admired him, respected him, and trusted him. Rick Middleton was a true Bruin. And tonight, his number 16 will be forever enshrined in the Garden's rafters. But before we get to all of that, we begin tonight's celebration with the introduction of our special guests. First, Rick's family his lovely wife, Liz, his children, Claudine, Jarrett, and Brett, his stepchildren, Evan and Sarah Sullivan, sister, Carol Roberts, and his nephew, Ryan Roberts. Thank you all for being here. One of our other special guests is the Chief Executive Officer of Delaware North Boston Holdings and the Boston Bruins, Charlie Jacobs. We'd also like to give a special welcome to Rick's childhood coach when Rick was growing up in Toronto. He was a man who believed in Rick and encouraged him to be his very best. Rick considers him to be one of the most influential people in his life and credits him as the person that made it possible for Rick to reach the National Hockey League. Please welcome Frank Miller. Another one of Rick's guests joining us tonight spent five seasons as the head coach of the Boston Bruins. He won the Jack Adams Award for Coach of the Year following this 1975-76 season, and for three seasons was Nifty's head coach and instrumental in teaching Rick to be a complete player. They call him Grapes. Welcome Don Cherry. Also joining us down here at ice level are five members from the 2002 U.S. Paralympic sled hockey team that Rick was the head coach of that won a gold medal at the Winter Games in Salt Lake City. Please welcome assistant coach Tommy Moulton and players Manny Gare, Dan Henderson, Kip St. Germain and Joe Howard. Thanks for being here, guys. Tonight, we would like to give a special welcome to the numbers honored by the Bruins organization who have created a legacy amongst the Raptors. Let's take a moment to recognize the Bruins greats who are no longer with us. Number two, Eddie Shore. Number three, Lionel Hitchman. Number five, Dick Clapper. And number 15, Milt Schmidt. Two other legends and honored numbers who unfortunately could not be here tonight. Number seven, Phil Esposito. And number four, Bob Yor. Now let's welcome four other of the greatest Bruins in history. First, he was an all-star on four occasions, led the team in goals in seven of his 10 seasons, three-time 50-goal scorer, still holds the record for most goals by a wing for a Bruin with 55, is the team's all-time leader in playoff goals, 
won the Masterton Trophy for his dedication to the sport, elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame in 2005, currently the president of the Boston Bruins. Number eight, Cam Neal. This guy was the team leader in every way for the 21 seasons he played in the Bruins uniform. He held every team career offensive record for over 20 years and remains the team's all-time leader in goals and second all-time in points. Served as the captain of the Bruins for five seasons, two-time Stanley Cup champion to go along with two Lady Bing trophies, elected into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1981, continues to be one of the game's great ambassadors, and is in his 62nd year with the organization. Number nine, the Chief, Johnny Busey. Next, this player epitomized the Bruins of his generation with his unmatched ferocity and toughness. One of just four Bruins all time to lead the team in scoring and penalty minutes in the same season. Team captain from 1983 to 1985, he ranks ninth all time in the Bruins points list and is the club's all time penalty minutes leader. Former coach of the Boston Bruins, number 24, Terry O'Reilly. He won the Calder Trophy and was named a first team All-Star his rookie season. He won five Norris trophies as the NHL's best defenseman. An All-Star in the National Hockey League for 18 seasons. Finished his Boston career as the team's all-time leader in games, assists, and points. And remains the NHL's all-time scoring leader amongst defensemen a 2004 inductee to the Hockey Hall of Fame, number 77, Ray Ball. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to welcome the next player in Bruins history to live on forever in the Garden Rafters. With 402 goals, he's third all-time in Bruins history. 496 assists, that's sixth all-time in club history. He led his team in scoring four straight years, led him in goal six consecutive seasons won the Lady Bing Memorial Trophy, scored the most shorthanded goals in team history. He's amassed 100 career playoff points. In fact, holds an NHL record for most points in one playoff series. And he's the fourth, the fourth all-time leading scorer in this Rich Bruins history. Please welcome 
number 16, they call him Nifty, Rick Middleton. since I've been up in front of thousands of cheering people and fans, it feels good, I'll tell you that. Thank you so much. I can't express my sincere appreciation enough to Charlie Jacobs, the entire Boston Bruins organization, Don Sweeney, and especially Cam Neely for retiring my number 16 tonight. It's awesome. Thank you, guys. And I really have to thank our Bruins alumni secretary, Karen Winoski, because she saved me with all the plans I had to make for tonight. Thank you, Karen. You were a lot of help. You know, Cam told me he had the Bruins equipment manager put the number 16 sweater away about six to seven years ago. But you still never know if it's ever going to happen. But the day it was announced, Ray had the best line. When he called me up to congratulate me, he simply said, welcome to the club. <laughs> and what a, what a club it is. I'm so proud to be included among the select group of great Boston Bruin players and to be one of only 11 Bruins to have his number retired in almost 100 years. And what makes it even more special is that I played with five of the ten players that are already up there. Unfortunately, Bobby wasn't one of them. <laughs> but I played with Espo in New York the year I got traded here. I played with the Chief, Johnny Busick, my first two years in Boston. And a man responsible for tonight, Cam Neely, my last two years. And I'm very happy to say I played eight years each with two former captains and great friends, Terry O'Reilly and Ray Bork. You know, in writing my speech tonight, I was reflecting on all the years that I played this wonderful game, and I realized if I can just keep my legs moving for another year, come 2020, I'll be entering my eighth decade playing hockey. Yeah, I'm old. You see, my dad froze a rink in the backyard in our suburb in Toronto in 1958, 60 years ago. And that was the beginning of a love affair for me with the sport of hockey. I started playing youth hockey shortly after that, and my father never missed taking me to a game or a practice, and my mother and even my grandmother would always go always to the games to cheer me on. I firmly believe that over the years I was very fortunate to have the three most important ingredients that any hockey player needs to be successful. Great parents, great coaches, and great teammates.
I got my first big break at the age of 13 when I tried out and made a team in, called the Toronto Young Nationals, who at the time had a coach by the name of Frank Miller. See, Frank was a power skating nut. And in just three short years, from 1966 to 69, he helped me improve my skating and my game so much that I got drafted by the Oshawa Generals of the OHA, which two other guys up here played for, Bobby Orr and Terry O'Reilly. And I received six full, full scholarship offers from U.S. colleges, with one of them being Boston University. I'm so happy that you're able to be here tonight, Frank, to help me celebrate my number 16 being retired. And I can't thank you enough for what you did for me so many years ago to help me make tonight even possible. Thank you, Frank. Well, over the next 10 years, I had several good coaches along the way, but it wasn't until I got traded to the Bruins in May of 1976 that I would get my next big break in my career when I met my new coach, Don Cherry. Or, or Grapes, Grapes as we call him. Grapes also coached me for three years from 1976 to 79. And let me tell you, we didn't always see eye to eye. <laughs> Don wanted me to be a more complete two-way hockey player and the way he was determined to do that was through attrition of ice time. Even though, excuse me, even though he did play me my first game as a Bruin on a line with future Hall of Famers Jean Rattel and Johnny Busick, and of course I got a hat trick, but then who wouldn't play with those two guys? But Don had a plan to get me out of my comfort zone as a one-dimensional player, and over those three years, it worked. I can't thank Don enough for having the patience and the vision to take my game to another level and for being here tonight to join me as my number 16 is retired. And John, congratulations on receiving the Hockey Legacy Award last night from the New England Sports Museum. Thank you. You know, when they asked me if I wanted to have some old 70s teammates join Don, I had to say no because I really didn't want to have too many men on the ice again. All right, Grapes, what do you think? You want to say a couple words? All right. Mr. Don Cherry. And my favorite Marchant, I like that. Anyhow. No, I, uh, when Harry Sidnett phoned me and he said, uh, we got a chance to get Middleton, do you want him? And I said, uh, well, I play, I coached against him in, he was Providence, eh? And I said, he goes that way, but he doesn't go this way. We had to introduce him to the goalie at the end of the season, I'll tell you that. And so what does he do? He goes out the first game and he gets a hat trick. And Harry said, you're in trouble now. Well, I'll tell you, you're, you're, I can't say how fortunate I am to have you here. You were one of the sweethearts on the club. We had a tough club back then. and. Um, uh, well, we did have a tough club, and uh, Terry O'Reilly led the way. Any, uh, anyhow, I can't take long. I got to get going. I just want to say, listen, you were great. I'm glad I had you, and I'm glad you learned how to play the game the right way. December 16, one of the best, Ricky Milton. Thank you very much. Well, he's always a tough act to follow, I'll tell you that. But at this time, I'd like to really re recognize some old and dear friends that can't be here tonight, but I know they would be if they could. These gentlemen were some of my biggest supporters and best friends from almost the first day I got to Boston until their days ran out on them. The reason I want to recognize them tonight is because in each case, their grown kids who I've known all these years are all here tonight to help me celebrate as their fathers would have been. My former teammate and coach Gary Doak, Jimmy Kalman, Lenny Silvestri, Dick Ray, 
Brian McGilvery, and the guy that made my transition from hockey to the real, well, hockey world to the real world a lot easier for me than it was for a lot of retired players, C.B. Sullivan. Thank you, guys. And I want to thank all you guys for being here. Well, I haven't said much about my teammates yet tonight, but it's not because I don't love every one of them. I really can't say enough about all the guys I played with here in Boston over the years. The Bruins teams I played on were always a close-knit bunch, and I am forever grateful for just being a part of those teams. I'm thrilled that many of them are here tonight up in our alumni suite to share the special night with me. Thank you, guys. I'd like to be able to name every one of them, from Donnie Marcotte, Wayne Cashman, and Peter McNabb, to Gordy Kluzak, Jay Miller, and the whole bunch. But unfortunately, there just isn't enough time. But there is one guy I need to name because he was probably more responsible than anyone for helping me to raise my game to another level in the 80s. I'm talking about Barry Peterson. I got put on a line with Barry by our new coach, Jerry Cheevers, just before the 81-82 season, and the next three years were magic. He was a first-year sentiment that had just come to the Bruins, and hockey for me would never be the same. My career was about to change in a very positive way. Barry and I clicked right from the start, and both of our games went to another level. I have to say that those three years were the most fun I had in my entire professional career. Thanks, Cheesy, and thank you, Barry. I'm looking real, I'm really looking forward to being on Nesson with you in between the first and second. Well, the years were now flying by, and before I knew it, they were calling me a veteran. My last couple years in Boston were a lot of fun, as my former teammate, good friend, and now fellow retiree had taken over as coach, Terry O'Reilly. And during the 86-87 season, I had the pleasure of playing on the left side with a new right winger who had just come to the Bruins, Cam Neely. And in my 12th, and as it turned out last season, I was fortunate enough to get another shot at the Cup in 1988. Even though things didn't go our way in the final, it was a great way to end a career by finally beating the Montreal Canadiens in a playoff series. for what I believe was 45 years of waiting. But ironically, my last game as a Bruin at the old Boston Garden was the night the generator blew and the lights went out. You can say the lights went out on my career that night, too. <laughs> but looking back, I don't have any regrets. The game in ho of hockey has been pretty much interwoven into the fabric of my life since I was four years old. Up until today, whether it was playing, coaching, working on Nesson during Bruins games, or as the president of the Bruins alumni. But, you know, just when I thought the competitive hockey was far behind me, a funny thing happened in early 2001. I received a phone call from a friend of mine who was the captain of the U.S. Disabled Ski Team. He asked me if I'd have any interest in coaching the U.S. National Sled Hockey Team as their coach had quit during the World Championships in 2000 and they were looking for a new coach for the Paralympics in 2002. I thought about it for about 10 seconds and told him yes. The next day, the president of the United States Sled Hockey Association, Rich DeGlopper, called me, who I'm happy to say is here also tonight, to tell me more about the team and the position. Well, you see, my buddy had forgot to tell me that the U.S. sled hockey team had only won one game in their history in international play, and then they would be seated six out of six teams last, because, and the only reason they were even invited was because they were the host team. Well, he then asked me if I was still interested, and I said, of course I was, even though I didn't know anything about sled hockey. All I heard were the words hockey and Paralympics, and I thought, what a unique opportunity it would be to be part of a U.S. team com competing for a medal. Well, it turned out to be the, one of the best decisions that I ever made and was definitely the most exciting and rewarding hockey experience of my life. I really wish I had the full time to tell you the whole story, but hopefully in the very near future, you'll have a chance to see our movie called Tough Sledding, as we have just finished writing the script.
Oh, thank you. All I can tell you is that it's an incredible story full of tragedy, deceit, romance, and finally triumph. Yes, we did win the gold medal, which I think one of the, one of the guys has with him right here. Hondo Henderson. I am so proud to say that we're a team that helped kick off the medal trend. Since we won it in 2002, the U.S. team has won a bronze and three golds in a row, with the last one being this year in South Korea. I know the guys have already been introduced, but I'd like to introduce them again. My assistant coach and good friend, Tom Moulton. Two, two pioneers of sled hockey in the United States. Was the goalie, Manny Guerra, gold medal goalie, and stay-at-home defenseman, Dan Henderson. And finally, these last two guys are hometown boys right from the state of Massachusetts, who are both members of the Massachusetts Hockey Hall of Fame. Assistant Captain Kip St. Germain and Captain Joe Howard. Congratulations, guys. It really means so much to me to have you here tonight. Thank you for coming. Well, in closing, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you New England hockey fans. Honestly, during the years, that I played in Boston and right up until today, while playing benefit games all over New England with the Bruins alumni, you've always been there 100% to support the team and the players. You're extremely passionate and knowledgeable about the game of hockey, and it's always been a huge thrill to play in front of you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, and thank you for being so good to me all these years. Thank you, Nifty. At this time, I'd like to invite Cam Neely and Charlie Jacobs to please come forward to present Rick with a gift on behalf of the entire Boston Bruins organization. This oil painting was commissioned by the Boston Bruins and created by esteemed professional sports artist Tony Harris, who has immortalized many of hockey's greatest players. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for, we ask Cam, Chief, Terry, and Ray to join us to unveil and present the number 16 banner where it will be raised to the TD Garden Raptor. to have you take your place in joining the greatest of the great, 
whose numbers will never be worn again and always revered. We ask that you and your family make your way over to raise your banner to the Garden Rafters. Congratulations to Rick and his family. This is truly a well-deserved honor. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes tonight's ceremony. We thank you for joining us, Rick, his family, special guests, and honored numbers for this incredible, historic evening. Thank you and enjoy tonight's game. It has been my honor to be in attendance for four of these ceremonies. Yeah. Now, I've had an opportunity to be in the building as four of those numbers got hoisted to the rafters, and I love oh. every moment of every one of them. It really is. What a, you know, the, one of the things that really stands out is the uh, mutual and admirational respect the different generations have had uh, for each other. And Ricky talked about all the guys in the alumni box uh, that he was there. And look at the hug right there with Terry and him goes way back and uh, it's one of those things it doesn't matter Billy what level you played or where you played there's always that special feeling with hockey players and this was a hockey night wasn't it when you see the smile yeah. on Rick Middleton's face yeah. and you see the, um, the the respect for the Bruins that he has the passion for them and also that what the, what the fans have for him and and I said this many times before I grew up a Bruins fan, despite a hardcore Bruins fan, despite the fact they grew up in Chicago. Chicago yeah. So this is a guy. So I'm sitting here as as close to a little kid as as I can probably get, remembering. Sorry, Barry, that means that you're older yeah, than me too. I appreciate but that. But it just it just brings back great memories and everybody out there enjoying themselves. Very 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 um, classy, almost. And when I say this, a beautifully simple yeah, ceremony, really was. clean and and just the the way it should be. The warmth. The warmth. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And you, Dale, you were right. Grapes had the good coat on. Oh, yeah. He, he wore the good coat, <laughs> Did he all disappoint right. you? <laughs> but, 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 but. Nifty had the best line. <laughs> yes, that was the best. The too many men on the ice line. You see him as he's going through, shaking yeah. the hands of all the players. I got to really give credit to Bruce Cassidy and the players. Uh, this is not an easy thing to be no. out here for not this amount all. of time. They've now got to get into the dressing room, get changed, get ready, come out and do warm-ups. Right here they got to get. I'm pointing to the head. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's a refocus, and these are creatures of habit, these players. But, Dale, you're absolutely right. This is what it's about. You're part of the Boston Bruins 
Women's Organization wearing that glorious sweater with that spoke B on it. So you're all part of it. And there's not even, I don't think there was any question, Barry, in Bruce's mind that his team wouldn't be out there. No, it wasn't. It's part of that generational shift and, and the importance of passing that torch on mm -hmm. and playing here in front of these uh, great fans that Ricky talked about and the expectation, the knowledge, the enthusiasm that this fan base has, not only, of course, here in Boston, but all around New England. And Ricky talked about that, of course, with the alumni who goes around and mm -hmm. uh, plays so many games in, uh, in all those smaller cities. We've all been there for them and just a great, great event whenever they're in town. All of the Bruins players have their nameplates on the backs yeah. of the sweaters, but they've got Rick's number, all with number 16. And this is quite the team photo that wow. you see being posed right here. All of the current members of the Bruins, the uh, the five now members of the Bruins whose numbers are retired and who are in attendance here tonight. Fun to see the jerseys from the other generations. Oh, too. I love yeah. some of those yeah, jerseys. Yeah, too. You know, and, and what, you saw him shaking hands with Ryan Donato. Ryan Donato said, Rick was always my dad's favorite player. Yeah. I wore 16 my whole career. I didn't wear it here because it wasn't <laughs> yeah, available. Yeah. That's why he's wearing 17. Well, one thing with growing up with Teddy, too, being so local in the area, his dad was that you were going to get a lot of the history taught to you because, obviously, of the respect that uh, Teddy has passed on, not only to his son, but uh, to the Harvard community and the hockey community in the greater uh, Boston and New England area. It's great. I mean, I've loved every minute of it. You see the number hanging in the rafters. Uh, there are those of us who say it maybe should have been there before yes, this, we but it's that. there when Correct. it matters.